ICQ podcast episode 266, Good Set of Headphones. Well, hello fellow Amateur Radio Enthusiasts and welcome to this, our 266 episode of the ICQ Amateur Radio podcast, supported by Nicholas Wood and our monthly and annual subscription donors. In this episode, Martin, M1MRB, is joined by Chris, Mike Zero, Tango, Charlie Hotel, Martin, Mike Zero, Sierra, Golf Lima, Dan, Kilo Bravo 6, November Uniform, and Ed, DD5, Lima Papa, to discuss the latest Amatam Radio news. Myself, Colin, M6BOY, rounds up the news in brief, and this episode's feature is a feature about a good set of headphones. Well, as always, it's our donors that keep us advert-free for the uh, ICQ podcast. And in this episode, along with our uh, monthly and annual subscription donors, we'd like to thank Nicholas Wood for his one-off donation. And he sends along just a, a quick note saying, thanks, chats, for a really informative and entertaining podcast. You're more than welcome, Nicholas. I hope you enjoy uh, the podcast being advert-free, like Nicholas and, say, those monthly and annual subscription donors. And we'd ask you to consider us by visiting www.icqpodcast.com forward slash donate where anything you can send away keeps us out of it free, and as I say, keeps us on the air. Well, now we join uh, Martin, Chris, Martin, Dan, and Ed to discuss the latest Amatam radio news, including additional access across the world and Radio Club of America's Young Achievers Award. I hope you enjoy. Well, hi guys, and welcome to episode uh, 266 of the ICQ podcast. Uh, this episode's uh, News Rounds Table. Today, I'm joined by Mr. Chris Howard, M0TCH. Evening, Martin. Evening, Chris. Uh, Mr. Martin Ruffell, M0SGL. Good evening. Good evening, Sorry, too. I sounded like Leslie then, didn't I? Sorry. Good evening. Oh, no. Go on, do an impersonation of Bill, doing an impersonation of Leslie, if you really must. <laughs> okay. The part of Leslie Butterfield will be played by Bill Barr. No, I can't do that. Sorry, Bill. That's even, even worse, isn't it? Good evening, Martin. <laughs> Good evening, mate. <laughs> and uh, uh, over in the States, we have uh, Mr. Dan Romacek, KB6NU. Hi, Dan. Hi, guys. Yeah, hi, Dan. And uh, in Germany, we have uh, Mr. Ed Durant, uh, DD5LP. Evening, all. Evening, Ed. Uh, say, uh, uh, Bill, Bill caught me out last time uh, when he did his impersonation of Leslie, which uh, I thought was that quite That was funny. very funny, though. I, I nearly fell off my seat when he did that. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 Bill and Leslie. Bill waits for Leslie, you know, and winds him up every time. So it is fun. They they enjoy each other's company, I'm sure. But uh, that's a good one. They'll be back soon. First news story: six meters, fifty megs is now allowed in Lebanon. Now I know very little about uh, Lebanon, uh, apart from it was pretty much a war zone for a long, long time. But. Uh, 50 megs or 6 metres, another country getting it. Uh, I'm quite excited about this. Uh, what do you think, Chris? Well, you know, any any uh, any news about people getting more frequencies is always, is always great news. And uh, Lebanon, Martin, I look on the map, is very close to Cyprus. So if you're ever over there, again, I know you visit Cyprus from time to time, listen now, on 6 metres, you might hear someone from Lebanon. Yeah, 6 metres is well worth a shot, and uh, hopefully it will be e- quite easily doable from there for me. Uh, Dan, do you uh, use six meters at all? You know, I'm really not a six meter guy at all. I, I keep threatening to get on, but I just just never do. No, no, it's uh, it's it's a band I quite enjoy. And uh, last year, Chris and I were out playing, and I think I did quite well one one afternoon on six meters. So, uh, yeah, Martin, it, that's the only time I ever actually worked six meters was that I think that that afternoon. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm like Dan. I've never really. I don't think I've actually got an aerial for six meters. So that's probably the reason why I don't use it. But there you go. Yeah, well, yeah, summer um, summertime so sporadic. Maybe I'll uh, give it a try. Yes, it's fun. You'll probably find your your long wire tunes up on um, six meters. Right, I would think so. Yeah, maybe, maybe it will. Yeah. Yeah. So, Martin, do you use six in at all? Do you know what I do? And for for years and years and years, I thought six metres with us was an absolutely pointless band because I'd never heard anybody on it. But um, I gave it a try when it was open, and it was absolutely amazing. I think I mentioned before, I was I, I heard someone, I replied to him, I was working all over Europe, had a load of really, really good, solid 5.9, 5.9++ contacts, not the standard 5.9 next, but a 5.9 solid contact, 
And when I was uh, shutting the radio down, I realized that I'd been running five watts the whole time. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's an amazing band when it opens. Um, unfortunately, my six-meter halo at the moment, although it's up, uh, seems to have developed a little bit of a fault with it, and the SWR's shot up. So I'm going to have to get up there and have a look and find out what's wrong with it. But, uh, yeah, another, another country on um, uh, six meters. It's uh, more uh, chances to play with VHF, isn't it? Certainly is, certainly is, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. Hey, are you a six meter person? I know your radio does it. Yeah, I've got a six meter antenna up, a six meter radio. Actually, got a combined six, four, and two meter tribander, VHF tribander. Yeah, and uh, the other thing about six meters is, of course, that it uh, it's affected by several different kinds of propagation. It it can even have like sky wave from HF bands when when uh, conditions are that way. But sporadic E, there's a lot of sporadic E clouds around at the moment on six meters uh, just this last week. Um, so you can you get you know, reasonable hops across Europe on six meters. And uh, the other one is um, tropospheric conditions like you get on two meters. So it's sort of between the HF and the VHF bands and, and gets the best of both, both worlds. But um, as was said, but the majority of the time, it's uh, it's a low range uh, VHF band, and then when it opens, boy, does it open! Yeah, certainly does. And in the northern hemisphere, the northern hemisphere where we all live, uh, we're pretty much coming into the six meter season, as you said, with all the sporadic E. So uh, I think it'll be fun. I think it's uh, great. We've got another country potentially to work, and anybody getting extra frequencies is good in my books. And uh, that ties quite nicely with the second uh, news story. Uh, Germany's getting a temporary allocation on four metres yet again, aren't they, Ed? Yep, that's right. Uh, So we've got the 70.150 to 70.180 megahertz. This was officially announced on the 2nd of May and runs to the 31st of August, which I reckon there's somebody in the uh, the regulator in Germany who is an amateur because that just about defines nicely the sporadic E season uh, in Europe. So uh, various limitations, 25 watts ERP, only horizontal polarization, no portable operation, all contacts have to be logged, uh, all the usual things, but plus also your beam direction. And yeah, any, any mode up to 12 kilohertz wide, uh, but it's definitely secondary user non-interference. Uh, the other users, users of that frequency are the military and the railways. And this test has been done now. I think this will be the fourth year. Uh, we're hopeful that uh, at some point the uh, the Bundesnetzagentur, Tour, who is the regulator, will actually say, OK, guys, you might as well have that frequency range permanently. But uh, at the moment, it's um, special temporary allocation but at least you don't have to apply to them in writing for it if you've got uh, a class a license you uh, you automatically get it for that period of time under those conditions and uh, i was very happy to be the person who actually broke this news because as it turned out i'd actually sent an email to the the guys at the bnet say asking how was it going you know is there any chance we might get it again this year you know you never you don't ask you never know uh, you never get an answer. And a uh, nice gentleman came back and said, well, we're working on it at the moment. We're discussing it. A couple of days later, he came back. Good news for you. The, we, we decided to allocate it. It will be in the next uh, official legal announcement coming out on May the 2nd. And conditions as last as last year. So uh, I put that to various news uh, sources. And uh, then the, the National Society, I think, got to know about it two days later. So, <laughs> and you never know, Ed. It might have been you actually that uh, reminded them to do it. So you might have actually been uh, part of this. Is great news. No, no, it was actually on the guy told me it was actually on the agenda of the meeting to be discussed. Okay. And uh, you know, just the machine rolls through that way. It's the same same thing at the end of the year, at the end of every year on the meeting to be discussed is whether the six meter allocation for German amateurs continues because that's also a temporary allocation. But it's on a year by year basis, so you don't really notice it so much. Yeah. yeah. Whereas this is only for what, three months, four months. But it could happen that one December somebody says, No, sorry, we had a problem on on 50 megahertz. Sorry, the amateurs don't have six meters next year in Germany. I don't think it's likely, but uh, it's always a possibility because both of these bands still have other users 
and therefore it's very much non-interference secondary basis yeah yeah that's good and chris i know you've uh, got us a uh, 70 70 meg radio or a four meter radio um i have i brought it mr rothwell i know <laughs> have you used it much I haven't used it an awful lot. I've got a couple of aerials for... Uh, it's FM only, so it's not um, SSP or any other modes. But uh, I've used it a couple of times, and uh, uh, I think you've always called, always called it in a friendly man, haven't you, for me? It's obviously the one where people are grateful to get a contact, and uh, yeah. we have a good long chat. Yeah, I think quite often it's uh, you go on there, and whoever whoever comes back to you, you you'll never get quick contact. It, you, there's no chance for a, a two- or three-minute chat on there. You'll be there no. for a good hour if you can. Yeah, absolutely. That's what. I, that's certainly, I, I can. Uh, yeah, certainly. Yeah, that's my experience as well. Yeah. So, if I can jump in and say for the amateurs in uh, the UK, please tune a bit further up the band or down the band or whatever, uh, because it's only seventy one five zero to seven seventy one eight zero for Germany, but we can do FM as well. I've got to ask the question: Why is this only a temporary allocation? I, I'm I'm curious as to what else is there that that could you know? Is, are they are the people there? that are currently the primary user of the band, are they making way to let the amateurs have a go and prove there's no interference? Is there, is there something of great importance there? Um, and, you know, this is not a particularly big area of the band. In fact, there's, there's, there's not very much there at all. So I'm curious as to why it's, you know, just why it's such a small, um, such a, a, a small allocation and for only a temporary time. Why not just say, hey, it's 70 megs, there's not a lot going on there. You know, you, we know you don't cause interference, it's used all around the rest of the world with no interference. What's the problem? Well, there is still a primary user. In fact, there's two primary users. But well, there um, is in the UK. It's the military. Yeah. Uh, well, no, actually, it's also the railways in Germany, and they use oh. it for their communications. So oh, okay. they don't want to have their communication interrupted while they're telling a train driver to stop his train because there's a train coming the other way on a one-track track, a one-line you know, one track. But they you have the band in the in, in the in the meantime are they what are they doing in during yeah, this i presume i presume the frequency range we've got doesn't clash with any of the railway channels okay. um but and and also the the principle the reason it's been allocated on a temporary basis is to make sure there's no interference the other thing is uh, i think the railway use vertical polarization as well which is again a reason why we're only allowed horizontal. to use horizontal yeah mm-hmm. um and well, the, i wonder what happens when there's a bit of sporadic e comes in from europe on that band, do the railway drivers, because you know, we all run vertical, do they not get interference problems? I know we have to turn the power down. I know we're limited to, what, 160 watts on four, I think. But do yeah, they not never get uh, interference problems, do you think? I, I don't know, but the biggest interference problems you'd get here are actually the TV stations out of uh, Russia, or the old Russian states, which are still, they're still not sorry, not TV, the FM broadcast stations, because there's a FM broadcast band like 69 to 72 megs or something. Oh, uh, yes. They still haven't moved everybody off there to the 88 to 108 yet. And uh, that's going to be more of a threat to the primary users than the amateurs. That does happen when the band opens. You can't, you can't use the band anymore. It's full of FM broadcast. We're probably not going to be very happy about having to move and re-sing all their jingles and everything else that they might need to do. Yeah, I think they've they've moved about eighty percent of them to the new band in 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 say these Eastern European countries. Uh, so the intention is that they're all going to move, but uh, it's taking them a while. Yeah, it's, all these things do happen. Then one thing or another. Dan, you've been very quiet, and uh, I know that in the states you don't have four meters. Although you were asking, uh, is is your radio easy enough to convert to four meters? Uh, should you get it? But uh, would it be a band you'd try? Well, so so I've been Googling around a little bit here as to why we don't have it in the U.S. And I came upon an ARRL story from 2014 that said the reason uh, someone petitioned the FCC to grant us four meters, and uh, the, the, the reasoning for that was the, all the TV stations were going to migrate up into UHF. But apparently, at least in 2014, there still were a few uh, TV stations on the in the 66 to 72 megahertz uh, region. So uh, I don't know. I, as four years ago, you'd think they would be gone by now, but who knows? May, so maybe maybe now's maybe, the opportunity for someone in the states to uh, petition the FCC and see if they want to uh, update their statements. 
That that's just what I was going to suggest. I'm I'm going to get a hold of this guy Glenn Zook K9STH and see if he might uh, uh, repetition the FCC again. Yeah, well, if he did and you were successful, that'd be another ban for you guys. So uh, that would be a good one. And, and this guy's the guy to do it because he uh, used to be the uh, VHF editor for CQ magazine. So uh, if you, anybody knows about uh, VHF allocations, I think it's him. Right. Uh, so that's a good one there, Dan. That's a good one. Moving on to our next news story, uh, Catering Student Young uh, Achievers Award. Now, Dan, you've met this young lady, Ruth uh, Willits, uh, KM4LAO. Uh, you met her the other other week, I believe, when you uh, ran a training course. Uh, would you like to go first on this one? Sure. So, yeah, R- R- Ruth is great. Um, she's uh, she's a freshman at uh, Kettering University, which is in Flint, Michigan, uh, just an hour up the road from me here in uh, Ann Arbor. And um, she's trying to get the uh, amateur radio club uh, at Kettering University uh, activated again. And Kettering University is an int- kind of an interesting institution. It uh, it started life actually as the General Motors Institute, and it was an engineering school run by the General Motors Corporation. And somewhere along the way, uh, uh, General Motors sort of stepped back from that. So now it's called Kettering University. And Kettering was named after um, a very famous uh, General Motors executive. A- anyway, that's that's sort of beside the point. So it's it's got a it's a small university. It's only got about a thousand students. But they're all science and engineering uh, 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 folks. And uh, like I say, she's trying to get the amateur radio club started again. And she asked, she emailed me about a month and a half ago or so and asked if I'd come up and teach a one-day tech class and get some more of the students uh, licensed. And so, of course, I, I said, sure. And uh, uh, we did this about a week and a half ago. And we got, uh, I think, three more students uh, licensed. So they're, they're well on their way. That's good. That's good. So uh, you know, three students uh, plus her—that's four. So that's um, that's a good start to an amateur radio club, I'd suggest. Uh, so and, uh, and the faculty member—they they still have a club uh, a club call sign, and the faculty member who's the trustee of that call sign is still on the staff there. So they you know they've got a faculty advisor, and they even have antennas. Uh, from the previous uh, in- incarnation of the club, uh, as I was parking uh, uh, there, I saw on top of one of the buildings, they have a little tower and the uh, beam antenna. So they even uh, even have antennas up already. Well, that sounds good to me. That sounds real good. Mine, what do you think? Uh, well, there's probably not very much I can I can say. It's nice to see young people getting into the hobby, as we, we pretty much always say when we get uh, stories like this. Um, but, um, yeah, nice to see people getting involved and... Um, um, we always say that the amateur radio is the future of uh, you know young people are the future of amateur radio. Well, again, this is this is proof, and she's trying to uh, resurrect the club, as it were, and breathe some uh, breathe some life or breathe some RF back into those antennas. And good luck to her. Yeah, yeah, I agree on that one, Chris. Do you, you got any comments on this one? Well, it's great to see that um, that uh, Ruth's managed to resurrect the club. It's great. Well done to uh, Dan for getting the. Uh, that do it really the course and getting some more folks on the license and uh you know hopefully this this will be uh, a you know uh, you know run run there and um and it'll you know certainly it sounds like uh the the, the you know the course that's uh that Ruth's doing the technology the uh, the engineering fits well with the hobby and hopefully it'll uh it will it will it'll go on for years yeah, yeah, that's great. Ed, in the pre-show, we were talking about uh, Ruth, and she's now 19. Um, you, you thought that uh, this, this award was for pre-18-year-olds, so uh, she's obviously recently had a had a birthday, but it's still a great achievement, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. And I think uh, the underlying thing here we could take away from this is that how important it is to try and get amateur radio back into in this case it's a university college but also into high schools if we can and and, and the u.s in the u.s we hear uh, quite often about that happening and i think that's really great we don't hear about it very much over here in germany and we don't hear about it i don't think that much of you know new club uh, clubs starting up in schools in the uk um, it would be great if there was any way that, as a hobby, we could try and promote that because there's so much we can bring to get younger children 
interested at least in technology and electronics uh, and radio and maybe they don't become radio amateurs but at least they get involved in technical interests that then drives them into their professions yeah yeah and uh, as I say the more people that understand how amateur radio works and how radio works the the more education comes uh, and the easier it will be for us because there's a lot of uh, what IBM used to term as fear, uncertainty and doubt about our hobby. Mm. And uh, this being an engineering uh, college, I'm really pleased that they want to understand the technology. So that, that's good, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right, the last news story, but, but we haven't done too many news stories this episode, but the last news story is going to be a long one. I, ha- I feel it in my bones. Um, additional frequencies for Ireland. The regulator Comreg have um, suggested that, uh, or said that they're now going to issue some new frequencies, and they are phenomenal. Uh, Ed, do you want to go first? I was just wondering if I could find Colin and get Colin to call in from Ireland, but uh, unfortunately it doesn't look like he's online. I, I'm actually blown away at the fact that uh, Comreg, the, the regulator in Ireland, has actually released for use by amateurs 30 to 49 megahertz, uh, 54 to 69.9 megahertz. What that then means, and they've also extended the four meters down by 0.1 as well to come down to that 69.9. What that means is they've now got amateur access to 30 megahertz all the way through to 70.130 with like one meg missing at 49 to 50 and two meg missing at 52 to 54. But they've got some really wide ranges there, and they're talking about using them for experimentation of new modes and wideband modes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But how on earth the uh, the IRTS, the Irish Radio Transmitter Society, managed to negotiate this? I think uh, a lot of uh, the other amateur radio societies around the world might learn something from from them, and. Yeah, it'll be really interesting to see what they do with this because um, we mentioned before the show that there's not that many other uh, countries on those frequencies. I believe South Africa's got something around 40 megs. But, you know, it, it's just it's just mind-blowing that they've been given so much. Yeah, yeah. Well, as I say, we were saying that they'd probably be talking to themselves very early on. Uh, but uh, I wonder... You know, we, we're suffering so much on HF with the noise floor raising, uh, being raised all the time. I wonder whether us amateurs will move up onto these frequencies. Just a thought. Uh, what do you think, Dan? Well, I like the idea of uh, experimenting with some wideband modes. That, you know, th- with this much frequency, they, they've really got a great opportunity here. Yeah, certainly have. And uh, as I say... I think um, I think it's going to be lots of opportunities there. Martin, you like uh, VHF as much as I do. In fact, we spend more of our time on VHF than anywhere else. I'd suggest. Yeah. What do you think? This, I mean, this this to me, this is a huge amount of space. There's part of me that that seriously wonders if this is a typo or something that got proposed that inadvertently got released, and Comrega perhaps going to say. Oh my God! We shouldn't have released that. That was complete acting. I don't know. Um, I don't know what other commercial stuff is 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 normally within those bands. I know there's like baby monitors around 40, 49 megs, and um, I could say we well, you know cordless phones used to be around thirty megs. What else is there? I don't know. Questions that come to mind: What equipment are you going to use? Now you can wideband your HF radio, but they don't generally go that high. I know the seventy three hundred. I think we talked about can potentially be opened. Um, but not everybody has a 7300. Considering that Mr. Icon has only just started making radios that support four meters, there's not going to be very much available commercially, not just radios, but antennas and things like that, or even firmware updates to open up the 7300. So I'm, I'm thinking a lot of this is going to have to be homebrew stuff, things that people build themselves. Is there a lot of experimentation for wideband experimentation, that sort of thing? Does, that, does a lot of that happen in Ireland, I wonder? I, I don't know, and the thing that, that worries me is if this does turn out to be, and I'm not saying that it is, if this does turn out to be an an error on Comreg's part, and I'm not saying that it is, 
there's going to be a lot of upset people if they've suddenly been told they've got this. They've gone away. They've invested time, uh, money building this equipment, and then suddenly something comes back and says, "Actually, um, sorry guys, that was a, a mistake." And then you've got a lot of equipment that 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 you can't use. Yeah, yeah, it's an interesting point. But the other thing is, in Ireland, uh, they don't issue amateur radio licenses. They issue amateur experiment licenses. So mm. it is an experiment as a hobby, effectively, in Ireland, rather than amateur radio. But so, isn't that, to some extent, what amateur radio is worldwide, yeah. isn't it? It's communicating and experimenting. It's just called, called something different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they emphasise on experimentation. So uh, okay. I'm a bit concerned because I have nothing that works on these bands, uh, frequencies, and I'm out there. I'm out there uh, later in the year. Mind you, might be my ASCOM. Uh, I think my ASCOM. Your four meter will probably go down to about. Your ASCOM probably go down to about sixty six. I think it does. I think mine mine goes from sixty six to uh, just under the FM broadcast band. So, and if you if you wide banded an HF radio, if you've got like a, a seven oh six or seven oh three or something like that, if you wide band it, you might find it go up as high as fifty four meg. But I don't think you get anything above that. Um, but of yeah. course, you've got to you know, dramatically change the size of your antenna at that sort of thing, haven't you? Oh yeah. Yeah, I mean to, to cover that frequency range, you're talking about something like a log periodic or something, aren't you? Cause yeah. As soon as you move a few megs, but then again, I think what you need to, or what we need only to do, is wait and see what the band plan from the IRTS mm. says, because if indeed they say, okay, we're going to allocate 10 megs of that for wide band. 16k tv experimentation whatever right and then the other one's a beacon area another one is for data transmission at uh, 100 megabits per second or, or what whatever then that would all that equipment would have to be built from scratch in any case yeah. so and of course you're not talking about necessarily using it for voice you're talking about using it for data for tv for anything else it's a similar sort of thing with the uh, i mean we got 145 to 146 for 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 two meters for I think digital experimentation. I think I, I, I think, you, I yeah. think you mean one four six to one four seven. Yes. Uh, no. <laughs> sorry. One four five to one four six. We got. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Yes. 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 Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no. You had one. You had one forty four to one forty six. You had a meg on top of it. Yeah, we yeah. did. Because so basically yeah. we got so, one same four with, six so, to one four. We got that, and but that was yeah. for digital experimentation. Right. But how many people have done digital experimentation? I've got the NOV for that. Um, so did I. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've you know had a bit of a, you know, a go up there. I've been up there. I've heard a couple of people chatting. I've gone in. I've said hello. Other than that, not really done much experimentation up there. My understanding was both that and the one was it seventy point five to seventy one point five in the UK. Uh, we well, didn't get that. That's been allocated. To didn't get that. Things, I think. Uh, okay. But uh, the intention, I believe, was digital TV, digital amateur TV. Okay. One one of the options. Yeah. But that doesn't so, need bandwidth. <laughs> I was going to say, so, I mean, just to add my comments to this one. So, I, I, again, I almost fell off my chair when I saw the amount of bandwidth, you know, the, the amount of frequencies that have been uh, allocated here. And that like I say, it could well be a mistake. It just seemed like a, a big announcement. In terms of kit, there is, of course, the new ICOM radio that's coming out, the 9700, which is the uh, the kind of sister radio to the, to the, uh, the 7300, you know, the one that we've all seen. So the, the, there's a VHF, UHF, uh, SDR that ICOM are bringing out. It's not. It's not actually out yet. I think it was announced last year. Yeah, but um, that, it, that's it's, that's it's, two meters up. Two meters to twenty three sems. But not yes, this but, range. But, 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 well, yeah, possibly. I think it also does. Hmm, does it do six meters? I think. No, no, right. no, no. Okay. So, so, so I, think it, I mean, it does sound like, and uh, also the interest seems to be going in the software defines direction, shall we say? It's going to be a lot easier to to. to do this in software than it is to try to it's, it's such a wide you know range of frequencies uh, and it, it, it'd, be, it'd be a real shame if, if, if the allocation was there and actually no one could use it because they hadn't got the equipment so whether I'm pretty sure that I'm pretty sure that it's, um, it won't take long for some folks to work out how to, how to get something to work on those bands and it'll be some sort of mod and people will do it and, 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 and get working on them mm. um, I'm pretty sure that uh, the opportunity it's, it's such a big opportunity that it's um, mm. Uh, some of our colleagues over in Ireland will, will be figuring out which rigs can be op- can be opened up to work on those frequencies. I wonder or, how long or, or be trans- before some. Sorry, no, I was just going to say. I wonder how long it will be before you talk about people doing mods. I wonder if those mods will be either like someone worked out how to rewrite the firmware to do it, 
or someone has come out with a, a hack, so to speak, similar to yeah. the 847 hack, exactly, that yeah. meant you could get four meters on the 847. It wasn't pretty, it wasn't good for the radio, but it, you could do it. There, there'll be something like that, and or, or I suppose... If it needs to be a transverter or, or something yeah. that's, that, that's that's I think transverters that... are probably the way people will go. That's yes. yeah. what I was trying to jump in to say, but never mind. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a wide, a wide band transverter with a HF rig uh, driving it. Yeah. So you know, like well, whatever four megs becomes forty megs, or you know, potential one no... thing. If people have got you know transverse yeah. designs, they make them. You know, you could. You know, you're onto something here. Mm. Yeah. It'd be interesting to see what comes about. I mean, I wonder if part of this is the uh, a reflection of what happened many, many, many years ago when the government said 200 metres, above 200 metres? Nah, it's rubbish. Do, no use to anybody. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll give it to the amateurs. Maybe maybe the Irish regulators have come along and gone, all our stuff is now aiming at SHF and microwaves and things for 5G and all the rest of it, Uh, the stuff between 30 megs and 100 megs, it's not a lot of use to us, actually. Just give it to the amateurs. We'll we'll, we'll happily take it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Might be interesting to see if uh, some other companies, countries jump on the bandwagon as well. Would be nice, wouldn't it? But that yeah. that brings on to a nice to another part, which is the other side of this uh, announcement, uh, or one that runs on from it about the radio re- regulatory changes in Ireland, is that they've actually changed some of the other bands and shortened or restricted what can be done with some of the UHF and SHF bands, and that's probably going to hit some of the amateur satellite service allocations because uh, they're not going to be able to be used. In Ireland, mm. so so you know, there's two edged sword here. But I get the feeling that that Comreg has said we're concerned about everything above you know 100 megs or 400 megs or whatever, and the stuff below it isn't so important. So we'll take as much of that back as we can, and oh, we'll we'll give the amateurs the the, the stuff we something else want. to play with in the interim. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. Well, I think I think this could be good news. You know, worldwide, even if if other people do it, because and say HF has been uh, terrible recently, and the noise the noise floor keeps going up with all the interference. Um, you know, us moving up to these frequencies is certainly going to sort of give a boost to our hobby. I'd have thought. Yes, but you talk about the noise floor problems. I mean, half the noise floor problems are caused by people with. We know they're caused by people with power line devices caused by people with dodgy plasma tvs and stuff is it is it not about time to recognize the fact that the radio spectrum regardless of where it is whether it's uh, you know however many kilohertz up to however many terahertz whatever regardless of where it is if it's interfering it, it shouldn't be there is it not time to slap the manufacturer and say right massive fines if you're caught producing equipment that does this this includes you know, if everyone got together and, and and prosecuted the manufacturers for making this equipment that, that can interfere, is you know is that not a better way to go? And then radio spectrum can be, you know, more freely available to to, to everyone. And you know, they might find that actually this useless frequency that we we found actually is really really useful, and we can do more with this. Yeah, but the but, problem is that, that there's so much stuff out there, Martin. That if you were to pass a law, you imagine you've got to pass a European law that take years to put put through. Then you then you start trying to prosecute people, and there's so much stuff out there. There's mm. so much stuff out there that, that that you're bolting you're bolting the stable door after the horse has gone. Yeah. Which yeah. Is, I mean, it, there's it, a lot of easy ways you can get rid of things. I mean, I'd I'd still argue that there we know we know there are telecoms companies that are peddling PLT. You know, you, you know, you could hit fine. You could hit fines on them straight away, couldn't you? It's right, you've been peddling them. You know who you sent them to. It's your responsibility to get them out. They're not going to like it, but I tell you what, they'd soon get rid of them. I don't think that's an argument we're going to win, to be honest. Probably uh, not. There's too many out there. Yeah. It's too many. It's too few amateurs and too many folks that have got these devices. Yeah. It's just not going to happen, frankly. But if it was protecting you, you... other radio services as well. If it was, if it, if it interfered with aviation frequencies, right, yeah. then mm-hmm. they, they'd be the first to hit it. Correct. Yeah, and I mean that's the point. The the amateur service is is not a primary service. It might no. be allocated primary allocation to a frequency range, but it's not. It's a hobby. Okay, yeah. it's an important hobby, an experimental hobby, a one you need in in emergencies, etc. But 
it's only if we can show that the interference coming from all these devices, a lot of which come from offshore uh, via um, buying through auction sites and things. So how do you prosecute those people? You can't. It's only if we can show that it's, it's affecting other services or people's health or whatever, right? Um, like the story we had the other day about the Wi-Fi not working very well. That could also have been somebody's faulty um, wall wart power supply yeah. that was causing the problem as well. And, yeah. and the other thing is saying, why, do we, why don't we move up from the HF bands to this VHF section? Uh, was to say that that won't be interfered with by all these different electrical devices as well. Um, it probably will be because it's only just another multiple of the the, the oscillator that's in these You wait devices. till somebody else designs something. Oh, I need this to do this and we'll design yeah. this product that does it. And and then, oh, no, it's interfering. Oh, it's only amateurs it's interfering with. But, yeah, but it isn't just only amateurs, and that's what we've yeah. got to be sure. I mean, that's the thing. I don't know how we do it. It's got to be something from the national societies or national bodies. And well, here, here it's, in got the to be something, it's got to be something quite dramatic in the press as well. So statement like, for example, e-smog is a greater hazard to diesel, uh, than diesel fumes to people's mm. health. Or to people's uh, standard of living, let's say, and then you can. Well, say, well you, you want to be careful about that, though, right? Because because you know here here in the U.S. they they put up some wireless uh, electric meters. Oh, everybody's you know be, even though it's very low duty cycle and very low power, everybody's claiming oh these things are making me sick. So so you want to be careful about that, I think. But mm-hmm. but here in the U.S., as far as interference goes, the AWRL uh, hooks up with the, the National Telecommunications Infrastructure Association, or it's a government agency, and the broadcast people to try and fight interference. So so I mean I don't know what's going on there in Europe, or but but here that's what they do here, and and in general they've been you know fairly successful. Yeah, yeah. and I mean I think rather. Bad in some ways, but I think the only way you're going to stop the bad equipment that's emitting it is by making the owners responsible, not the people that sell it, or both, actually. So if somebody buys something over eBay from China and it's causing interference, they are liable. They should be fined. Maybe it's a um, a case of raising awareness, saying, hey, if you're buying this yep. stuff, you need to know, yep. one, it's doing this. Okay, you don't care that this, but this... This product you have, as long as it's doing what you want it to, you don't care what the what the ramifications of it doing it. But if you say if you if you make people aware, actually it's doing this, it's causing all these problems, and we run we reserve the rights to slap you for using it. No, uh, you've got to make example of a few first yeah, yeah. to get them in the press. Yeah, mm, you know, uh, I, I just don't. And, think it's and, and, enough, you know, I mean, it's you know, not going to happen. We know that, well, but you know, the, the people are running an illegal transmitter. Why don't you prosecute them? Yeah, it's a good point. That's what it is. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah but, but, but you could argue that my illegal transmitter was supplied to me by, I don't know, my doesn't telecommunications matter company. Doesn't matter who you know, supplied who it. You're, you know, you're company. operating it. You're operating yeah. it. It's in your. It's on your premises. Yeah. So I mean, Fair you enough. know, there's all these things we could say we'd like to get done. Unfortunately, it's not going to be easy to get it done. But without any sort of big press push from the. Uh, the amateur radio bodies to to highlight e smog as being yeah. a hazard to standard of living, let's say, rather than health. That then covers a lot of things, like your radio stopped working yeah. on the FM broadcast band, uh, or you know, or something else. There's isn't. all sorts of things. Maybe I've, this is a chance to pe- again peddle your local, your your, your national societies. Say, hey, come on, guys! You now we pay to be a member of you. You got to stick up for rights. Help us out here. You need to you need to peddle this information. But factual information, not the kind of information that we unfortunately see in the in the press. That is, is you know, you're you're knackering my Wi-Fi. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, it's the it's always the headlines people read, not the details. Yeah. So it needs to be a provocative headline to get their attention, and something will happen. Now you mentioned e smog. That's the first time I ever heard that phrase. I just googled it. I and I heard a, it, and I I immediately knew what Ed meant by it. There's a whole raft of products you can buy. I just Googled it and just clicked on one particular link here. You can oh, buy this... a bed sheet, which protects you from... It costs 100 I'm not going to mention the website, because obviously that's you know potentially not going to be good. But um, £157, you can buy a, 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 a bed sheet, which protects you from RF uh, electrostatic <laughs> waves and... 
See, no, see, that's why I, that's why I always say we got to be careful about that because there's yeah. a lot of like craziness out there about yeah. about this stuff. And I, I would say like even absolutely at this minute, let's not say e smog ever again. <laughs> just from uh, just from looking at what's on Google, e smog, e smog, e smog, e smog in in government mobile documents. Is your mobile phone killing you? It comes yeah. upon Google. You know. Yeah. Do, do you know what? I, I mean, I've just found this website. Now there is no doubt in my mind that high amounts of radiation are not good for you we we you, you ever talk to a tower worker guys that climb, climb transmitters yeah. for a living they get to the high powered part of the tower they radio down to see hey can you turn the power down if they've got to pass a high powered aerial years and years ago next to my bed i had a cordless telephone it was one of the the dex telephones it ran at 1.8 gigahertz 1.9 gigahertz uh very low power i don't know how many milliwatts that they run and i put it there and every single morning i woke up with a splitting headache this thing was less than two feet from my head i mo- I, I i thought for ages what is it eventually i moved it away realizing what it might be moved it away never had the problem again so there is no what, doubt in my mind was, that was that can be harmful was that a decked phone in a charging base? Yes. The base Sorry, vi- a decked the- phone in a charging base that has the transmitter in it that's constantly transmitting it effectively yeah, itself. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, okay, yes. But it also possibly was vibrating at supersonic fre- uh, frequencies inside it. But years ago, I also had a mobile phone. It was a very early Motorola phone. Mm. Um, other brands are available. But this was one of the really uh, the, the brick-type phones. Use that for 20 minutes. Headache straight away from that so martin yeah. there's a blanket i can, I can recommend that will sort yeah. all out for you, no do, you know, do you know what i i i've i've got i found that website i'm looking at it now and oh dear it's Go, the best guys. One. there's one here there's one that's selling eat sorry i know we've gone way off topic now there's one here <laughs> yeah. selling eat, a, a four pack of e-smog chips and it's some kind of i don't know what it is some is it, is this like cards. the equivalent to um, to giving up smoking, where you take the the like the the, the nicotine tablets or the e vaping <laughs> and things like this that? This is basically snake oil, isn't it? Let's be honest. Yeah, guys, <laughs> no, guys, we're we so here. far off topic. We're so far off topic. It's yeah, interesting. This is an editing nightmare <laughs> for Martin. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> I'm going to leave it in, yeah. but we're so far off look, topic. Just, um, just, just, just to get the e smog word back again, right? Yeah. Uh, look up electro smog in Wikipedia. Yeah, because yeah. and cause, and also in in German government documents, it's mentioned as well. Yeah. So e smog as a term is used. It's misused by other people. Okay, but what I would say is, I think we're all in agreement that uh, these extra frequencies in Ireland are very uh, well received by amateurs. Um, if we were in Ireland, we'd be extremely happy, and. The other things you're talking about, about e-smog, I don't believe that we'll be sitting at our desks wearing tinfoil hats in the near future. <laughs> uh, but if we ever find that we get to Martin's house and he's wearing a tinfoil hat, we will tweet a picture of it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've no Martin doubt you dragging would. Is back on topic, by the way. I think, yeah. Chris, at the National Ham Fest, we need to get Martin a tinfoil hat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Yes, I agreed. Yeah. Let's see if we can get one. From- oh, I'll have a look on eBay now. <laughs> <laughs> we just made one. <laughs> right. Well, I think that that's uh, pretty much done that one to death. So th- thanks on that one. Guys, uh, we're going to run around now, find out what you've been up to. Uh, Dan, what have you been up to since the last episode on Radio Wise? Uh, you know, I'm still uh, working on my uh, my n- updated tech study guide, and uh, that's uh, that's really taking a lot of my time. Uh, what else? Um, you training? You know, not, not not a lot, not a lot of other stuff, really. Oh, I, I tell you what, it is. I'm I'm actually working on an, uh, with another guy. We're we're thinking of doing a podcast of our own, and we're going to call it the No Nonsense ham radio podcast and you know like we're we're talking here for quite a while we're gonna we're gonna limit it to about 20 minutes length so we're gonna it's gonna be no nonsense we're gonna get in there punch the topic and get out I, good. D- yeah i think it'd be good dan um uh, we, we, that, we, that just does sound like competition to me i'm just registering that domain name now <laughs> <laughs> no no, no hey, and, and, and don't go over two men two, two people in the podcast as soon as you go over two <laughs> you've got that, no chance of keeping it on topic exactly no. that's why it's just going to be me and him yeah <laughs> now i wish you every success on that dan i hope you still stay with us um but uh, oh I yeah sure we wish you every success on that one and you know i 
the guys are right. The more the more people you have on a podcast, the more, the more uh, thoughts you have. Chaos there is, and we do the diversify. Side of, that, of course, is you. The more points points of view you get, so it's everything's different, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the earlier podcasts when it was just Colin and I were a lot lot shorter, but uh, these roundtables are enjoyment. I, I enjoy doing them, so I don't uh, try and stop you too soon. Well, that's good, Dan. We'll look, we'll look forward to, to you doing that one. Ed, what have you been up to? Uh, my biggest achievement is I actually had my very first QSO on DMR, Digital Mobile Radio. Is that right? DMR, anyway. It's the the uh, the digital voice mode for VHF, the new one that's competing against the likes of D-Star and ESO Fusion. Um, and the repeaters are popping up like mushrooms around here. And I actually bought myself a cheap and cheerful uh, Baofang RD5R, which is uh, actually, as it turns out, actually quite a reasonable uh, uh, handy talkie. And the biggest negative I've got for it is not the RF side or anything. That'll work from day one. But programming the thing, it's taken me two and a half weeks to get the code plug coded up um, because there's so many different things in DMR that have to that are interrelated and have to be set up correctly. And I also had some faults come up on it, and I thought, what have I done wrong? Then I saw there's a new firmware upgrade that came out, and it fixed all the faults. So uh, I'm actually quite happy that I've managed my first DMR QSO, which was into the UK. Uh, it was actually over a uh, repeater here in southern Bavaria, into the Brandmeister DMR network, uh, then out to, I think it goes to a hotspot, and then into the ESO Fusion network, and to somebody uh, in in the UK running actually a ESO Fusion handy talkie. Was that and a CQ UK all worked. room? Was that no, a CQ that, UK room, though? No, that was, uh, it's a SOTA link. Okay. It's, a, it's um, yeah, it's, it's sim- similar idea to what you're talking about, um, but this is actually privately set up, and I think at the moment D Star, Yeso Fusion, and DMR talk together, and there's a possibility of other things being added. You know, like IRL or Echo Link as as add-ons as well. That's almost identical to the uh, the CQ UK, which is a a mm. uh, it run it runs out of someone's house in Yorkshire, yeah. I think, somewhere. Yeah, yeah. I think I think the guy that built this one. Uh, actually talk to the guys at CQ UK to get some some info so Probably, but yes yeah, yeah. but it's nice it's also nice to see that these up until probably even two or three months ago uh incompatible networks can now talk to each other yeah yeah so i mean i can talk to sort of through this i can talk to somebody who's running d star i can talk to somebody who's running on the on the uh ysx or yeso fusion networks and uh also uh, obviously dmr so that was the big thing. I said, radio related, but not the RF side. It was all the all the configuration work. It took ages to get it right. Yeah, I know. Ed, um, having worked on DMR stuff, you get one parameter wrong and it don't work. So uh, that's right. Yeah, been there, been there, got that T-shirt. Unfortunately, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I perhaps set a uh, set a too big a challenge to start with. I decided I was going to get all of the uh, repeaters in Bavaria into my code plug. Um, which I've done, but uh, it's an awful lot of work. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a and uh, there's um, quite a fair bit of stuff that isn't used for amateur use that is in the commercial market. Yep. Uh, some of the parameters, and that that can also give you a nightmare if you uh, click one of those on, because uh, you find the amateurs won't uh, use it. But there you go. Yep. Mine, you were fairly vocal a minute ago so what you've been up to well, radio wise since <laughs> last time uh okay. but you've been out of the country i know that i've been out of the country yeah i've well since since i was last on this podcast um i've got married i've had a honeymoon i'm now back in the uk uh working all sorts of uh, ridiculous times so i work quite a long way from work so uh from home so my commute is quite big so don't get a lot of a chance to uh, do as much as uh, i used to most recently in, in fact pretty much the only bit of radio i've done um in probably since since i was last away is uh channel fusion and uh you and i martin chat uh 
uh, most mornings as I'm uh, you're on your way to work I'm on uh, you know in the car I'm uh, walking down to the bus stop uh, uh, chatting through the local uh, uh, fusion repeater so that's uh, nice that's just uh, local chit chat repeater died actually a month or so back uh, fortunately you say uh, a couple of the guys from the club were able to uh, fix it one of the guys that actually works at the site and uh, had quite a few comments recently that it's working really really well on receive so whatever we did apparently has made a huge huge difference and i've noticed that on digital as well but other than plugging it into a different socket we've done nothing so i'm curious as to know what's happened but as i say scaffolding at the site may have affected something there so i'm still uh curious to find out about that but no radio wise um just just fusion uh, and fusion and a little bit of tuning around just to see um, what's around but i haven't um, done very much other than that i feel bad because i'm letting the d-star side down oh yeah, i need to fly the d-star flag uh, this weekend ah but you'll be working me on fusion tomorrow morning <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah yeah chris what have you been up to since the last time uh, we well, trickled yeah it's not been long since i think it was on the last episode wasn't it so it's not i've only I mean, a couple of weeks so i've not done a huge amount um the usual kind of odd contact on hf i did recall we're working uh g8 bbc uh on 40 meters the other day which is the the bbc broadcasting house shack station uh, so that was nice to work jim uh, although it was very 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 noisy and very difficult but uh, he managed to copy my calls on at least so he got me in the log which was great at the weekend we've had just, just had a bank holiday here in the uk and uh on monday i was down at uh, the south coast and uh, on the way back, I heard uh, GX1WOR calling, and um, I recognised the voice of our fellow presenter, Edmund. He, he was chatting with somebody else, and I broke in, and I definitely heard Edmund fall off his chair when he heard me come back to him, because uh, he wasn't expecting me to be where I was. So I uh, had a quick chat with him. Unfortunately, uh, I was mobile, so I didn't um, didn't have a long chat, because I was uh, in and out. The, 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 the signal wasn't great, but at least, again, he heard me, and... Uh, and uh, what a, a very short, brief contact. Other things mainly have been sort of club type. Act- We've had a few uh, club admin type things to sort out. So nothing too interesting. Things like the new GDPR regulations that are coming in, and some things around that, and uh, and some other stuff. So not not so much operating, more kind of club admin type stuff. So uh, not a huge amount for me this time, Martin. No, no, no. But we did. Uh... No, it must have been more than two weeks ago. We were on the Belfast, but uh, I was but, thinking whether or not that was actually prior to my previous uh, yeah. um, appearance on the on the podcast. I think it might have been actually. Yeah, but we're going to be there on the nineteenth, aren't we? Nineteenth of May, we'll be there again. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah so, so listen uh, out for us, and it will still be the new. Uh, I think it's still the uh, the special event call sign for the eightieth um, anniversary of the launch of the ship, which is. Uh, GB80 GGCN. So if, if you're if you're listening out on it, or it well, actually probably both. Um, it could be any band, really, couldn't it? Because we'd be operating most bands from there. Listen out for that call sign, and uh, we might have a chat on the nineteenth. We must certainly do. And uh, Colin uh, said there's uh, a couple of listeners from Australia that are threatening to come and see us. So that'd be quite uh, quite enjoyable. And uh, we, you know, we're we're a sociable bunch, so. Uh, if you are on the Belfast, when we're there, we we'll always say hi, and we may even let you operate if you're an amateur, so uh, that'll be good. Well, what have I been up to? Well, not as much as you guys. Um, interestingly, HF's been particularly dead, and I, I've used the software defined radio, and, and it, it seems quite strange. And I know broadcast stations put out sort of megawatts and all that sort of thing, but on 13 megahertz, there's been loads of strong broadcast stations around. You go up to uh, 20 meters, 14 megahertz, nothing. Absolutely dead as a dodo. And I, um, I had a bit of a poke around. Anyway, uh, Sunday, last Sunday, decided to get the HF out. And I was going to sit in the garden, or uh, the backyard, as our American co- co- colleagues would call it. Uh, put up an aerial and uh, see how I could work. And up and down 20 metres, nothing. Uh, nothing on 80, nothing on 40. Although my error won't tune up on 80 or 40, so that was a waste of time. And pretty dead. Apart from, on 20 metres, there's a Bulgarian calling CQ. And I went back to him and he said, no, I only want to work at stations outside of Europe. And I thought, well, what's the point in that when there was nobody else on the band? And then later on, I heard a Russian and he only wanted to work people outside of Europe. So I thought, well... 
I've, I've spent all this time putting uh, the gear together. Nothing. Anyway, dro- dropped over onto 17 metres. There was only one station I could hear on 17 metres. Uh, but I actually managed to work him. And he was in Pathos in Cyprus. So, uh, you know, I got one good uh, one good contact Sunday afternoon and into Pathos in Cyprus from South London. So I was quite pleased with that one. So uh, that's pretty much uh, most of what I've been up to. So uh, I think we've all been busy, but uh, let's say a good one. Well, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for joining me today for the podcast. Uh, it's probably gone a little bit long. I'd like to thank Mr. Chris Howard, M0 TCH. Cheers, guys. Another uh, another fun time. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Uh, Mr. Martin Ruffell, M0 SGL. Very welcome. Good to be back. Yeah, good to have you back. Mr. Dan Romacek, KB6NU. Thanks for having me again. No problems, Dan. Good to have you. And Mr. Ed Durant, DD5LP. Yeah, thanks, guys. E smog. E smog. Okay, Ed. Uh, keep uh, taking the sense. tablets. <laughs> Silence that, <laughs> mate. Yeah. 73 is all. 73. 73. 73. Keep your amateur ham radio podcast advert free by donating less than a length of coax. Visit www.icqpodcast.com forward slash donate now. For all the news, links and information, visit www.icqpodcast.com. Now it's time to look at the news in brief with me, Colin, M6BLY. And we start off news of a special event uh, happening in Wales. The Barry Amateur Radio Society will be active from Her Majesty's Royal Mint in South Wales. Uh, they'll be using the call sign GB4RME, Romeo Mike Echo, for Royal Mint Experience. And they'll be on air on the weekend of the 1st and 2nd of June. It's a two-day event only, uh, as I say, and it's the theme of covert radio as used in World War II. At the same time, the Royal Mint will be releasing a new special 10 pence piece of coin showing the legendary Special Agent 007. Activity will be on uh, CW, uh, Single Sideband, Data Mode, JT8, plus Satellite Operations. And uh, QSL will be via uh, Gold Whiskey Zero Alpha November Alpha Direct or via the Bureau or Log, log Ticket of the World. This is uh, potentially a very good uh, event to work if you can. The Barry Amateur Race Society were highly commended by the RSGB last year on their Club of the Year awards, and this was certainly one of the events they picked up on. So certainly uh, mark this one in your diary. This one could be uh, quite an interesting one uh, for you to work. You may have caught uh, media stories that uh, next weekend is the royal wedding of uh, Prince Harry and uh, Meghan Markle. This is certainly attracting lots of media attention and uh, the RSGB are uh, advising uh, UK amateurs that they can celebrate the royal wedding by applying for a notice of variation. Uh, The agreement with Ofcom for this notice of variation is authorised a temporary use of a regional secondary locator R for Romeo after the UK uh, call sign prefix. And uh, this uh, will be valid only between the 19th and the 21st of May this year. So we'll put a link on the ICQ podcast website uh, about how you can, uh, let's say, uh, apply for your uh, special R uh, locator. um, And say you can uh, take part and celebrate the Royal Wedding in the UK. Across Europe, uh, GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, will be coming into effect at the end of May. And uh, this will have an impact upon amateur radio clubs. Uh, across Europe and how they process data of their members. There is no exemption for amateur radio clubs on a not-for-profit basis, so amateur radio clubs will need to uh, look at the regulation and make uh, changes, etc., as required to comply with the GDPR regulation. Our friends at Essex Hams have uh, put up a post on their website which uh, details lots of uh, good information on this, and uh, what we're going to do is we're going to link across to that uh, that section, uh, as I say, uh, which will be interesting from there. Now, remember, this regulation is European-wide across all 27 member states, including the UK, as they still come under EU regulation before uh, Brexit. So say it is uh, certainly worthwhile uh, clubs uh, checking out this information and seeing what they need to do to comply. So say that those links will be on the icqpodcast.com website. Well, now we head over to our feature this episode, which is a feature on a good set of headphones. I hope you enjoy. And now, what you've all been waiting for, this episode's feature from the ICQ podcast. Hi guys, for this feature, I wanted to talk about a good set of headphones. 
I am surprised that we haven't covered this topic before. However, after 260-odd podcasts, uh, it's now raised it to the top of the pile. I wanted to talk about headphones because we all have them, and in many ways, uh, we buy them for all sorts of uses. We buy them for hi-fi, we buy them sometimes for amateur radio, uh, we have earbuds with our mobile phones and various music players. And quite honestly, there are lots of different uh, headsets out there. And are they any use to amateur radio? Well, I've got to tell you, uh, the one gentleman that uh, kind of aimed me towards this talk was a guy called Richard Perziner. Uh Richard's call sign is G8ITB. And Richard turned up at the club the other week and he had a set of Kenwood headphones, HS5s. And he said, are these any use to anybody? And I went, yeah, yeah, I'll have a, I'll have a play with those. And I was quite happy. Took them home and, uh, as I say, put them on the radio. They worked very, very well and I was very, very happy. But it's not me trying to tell you to go out and buy Kenwood headphones. What are your choices when you looking at various headphones available on the market? Well, as I said, at the cheap end, you've got the earbuds. Some of those are not quite so cheap as others, but the earbuds, the things you put in your ear. Now, I don't find those particularly comfortable for long periods of uh, either listening to music or operating, and I have used them in the past. Also, the hi-fi headphones, they can be expensive, or you can find cheap ones. The cheaper ones don't tend to fit the ears particularly well. And, you know, they they do, they serve a purpose, but they're not customized for amateur radio. Now, if you're going to start looking at other headphones that you might want to use amateur radio, I wouldn't suggest new, not unless you've got deep pockets, but uh, sometimes aviation headsets come up on the market, uh, rallies and things like that. So a set of aviation headsets, set might actually be uh, quite interesting and worth a look if you see them and once again you really need to check out make sure that uh, they're comfortable and that sort of thing for yourself now i spend uh, time with the cambridge hams group uh, and uh, every time i see them at rallies they're a great bunch of guys and they were telling me that they decided to go down the gamer route of headsets they said that uh, Headsets designed for computer gamers are very useful because A, they're quite reasonably priced and B, they are designed for comfort because the person's going to wear this headset for hours on end. So that could be an option. Uh, They were very, very excited about uh, the headsets they use and uh, certainly an option there. Ham radio headsets, well, the various manufacturers do make them. As I said, I've got a set of Kenwood HS5s. They've been around now for nearly 40 years. They haven't changed the design for 40 years. So, kind of, they must have been doing something right. And when you look at the frequency response of them, 150 hertz to 4 kilohertz, approximately. You know, they ain't designed for hi-fi. But then when you think about it, our... uh, our transmissions are only 2.7 kilohertz wide on SSB, so they more than cover all the frequencies we need. So, uh, you know, that's one option. I know Heil make headsets, and uh, various other manufacturers make headsets. So, kind of, there are amateur radio headsets out there if you particularly want to go an amateur radio route. Now, if you're going to connect a set of headset to your radio, what type of headset uh, you're going to put on depends on the socket on the front of your radio and it depends on the, its uh, its specification. Now, you need to know what impedance the headset is. Now, the uh, the Kenwood ones are 8 ohms. Uh, however, most uh, modern headsets that uh, people buy for hi-fi or phones and that are 32 ohms. Now, if it's a, if you're using a 32 ohm set of headphones into a uh, amplifier that wants to drive into eight ohms, they're not going to be very loud. That might be a safety issue uh, for you because they won't get very loud, but uh, you will have an impedance mismatch. D 
do you uh, use mono or stereo headphones? You know, it depends on the socket on the front of your radio. If it's mono, uh, you may only get it in one ear. So uh, think about that. If it's stereo, you may have to uh, wire, the, wire them separately or different to, to make sure they work properly. Frequency response, as I said earlier, you don't need up to 20 kilohertz for frequency response for amateur radio use. You know, up to about 4K is probably perfectly okay for what we want. To much more than that, and uh, it's wasted because it's never going to get used. In fact, all you'll hear is uh, the hiss. You know, when you're on SSB and you're in that background hiss all the time, uh, if your headset to uh, can't do do those frequencies the high frequencies you ain't going to hear as much it's going to effectively filter out a lot of the background noise for you uh what type of cable you use now cable you can either cable them in or you can have wireless uh, headphones and i have a set of wireless headphones the only caveat on those are they're a reasonable set of headphones but i live in a really built up area and unfortunately Somebody within about a 200 meter radius of me, because these things work up to about 200 meters, which is phenomenal. Somebody in the area sits and listens to, um, let's put it this way, adult movies. And uh, they have a similar set or a same set of headphones as me. And it's very off putting when I'm trying to listen to DX and uh, we're getting some grunting and groaning going on. So, Wireless headphones, maybe not your best choice. Um, say cable headphones, be very careful with your cable so you don't want to uh, trap them and do silly things to yourself. How heavy a set of headphones are can also be important. Or how light. If they're too light, they might not uh, fit on the ears properly. If they're too heavy, uh, after a period of time, they start distressing you because of the weight. And... The more expensive headphones, if you're going to pay a lot of money for a set of headphones, make sure that they make available spare parts. You know, extra ear pads and things like that, you'll be able to get them. So the more expensive ones, usually you can get spare parts to keep them going a lot, lot longer. Now coming on to safety issues, and I know I usually cover safety whenever I do a talk on anything, but cables. Yeah, we talk about cables. Only use your headphones when you're sitting down. Uh, make sure that you take them off before you get up because you don't want the rig following you across the uh, workbench onto the floor behind you as you walk away. And also uh, make sure that the cables run in a sensible position so that you don't uh, trap it, you don't get caught up in anything like that. Now with headphones, we all do it, but uh, we should set the volume at a level that's comfortable at the start of uh, operating and then leave it alone. Don't uh, go turning it up because uh, over a period of time, you become desynthesized to uh, the volume. And uh, if you're not careful, you can keep turning the volume up, keep turning it up, and eventually you'll end up damaging your hearing. Uh, and exactly what I was saying on the uh, talk about DBs a, a few episodes back. So just be a bit careful. And once again, Wait, if you've got a neck problems, you don't want a set of heavy headphones, do you? Because if you've got uh, neck problems, that might give you some stick. Now, my suggestion is, if you're going to spend serious amounts of money on a set of headphones, you should be able to test them for more than a few seconds. You know, if the dealer just pulls them out of the box and says, just try them on, yep, yeah, that's okay, thank you very much, give us your money. No, uh, you want to be able to try them on for at least five minutes, I would suggest. Probably a little bit longer if you can. You know, if they haven't got a demonstration set, then, uh, you know, that's pretty poor. But equally, if you're seriously going to buy a set, you know, you want to make sure that they do fit you. You do feel comfortable. You, you don't feel that the headband's squeezing your head after, uh, you know, a couple of minutes. So whatever you do, please buy headsets by testing them first. You know, if you're only spending you know, three or four pounds, then, you know, that's probably not worth it. But when you're spending on the, the expensive ones, give them a test first. Now, headphone accessories. Well, if you've got a set of hi-fi headphones that you're really happy with, 
Why not think about uh, some of these audio filters? And uh, this is not just a recommendation, but I have one. Uh, Soto Beams do a audio filter for SSB with uh, a small amplifier in it. Now, quite useful. I find that quite useful. That will roll the high frequencies off for you. And um, certainly they use it at hi-fi headphones if need be with your rig and uh, cuts off the high frequencies quite nicely. Others are available, as so I have a set of soda beam uh, filter. Uh, other people make them. Also, for field day and things like that, when the operators are operating, you've got the operator and the logger on uh, a set of headphones. We have a four-channel headphone amplifier. That's a four separate channels headphone amplifier. Now, I'll tell you which one I use. It's one from Bellinger. And they cost about £20. I couldn't make one for the uh, price they charge for them. Nice little metal box. It's four separate channels, four separate amplifiers. What that means is that the operators can be working away. And if you get guests or anybody else wanting to listen in on what's going on, uh, you just give them a set of headphones and say, that's your volume control. And they can adjust it to a level that's comfortable to them. And equally, if you're operating overnight in a field or near anybody that uh, is going to be um, up and about, you've not got that horrible noise going on all night long. So uh, you'll be uh, a lot happier with people, or they'll also be happier with you. And the other thing, remember, with headphones is you may want headphone adapters. Now, in my days, it was quarter inch, but I believe it's 6.5 mil. Uh, they're 6.5 mil or 3.5 mil, so the small or thick one, mono or stereo. So uh, if you've got a few adapt spare adapters that uh, you can switch from one to another, uh, you can move your headset from different radios and enjoy the same set of headset on multiple radios. In operation, well, I think headsets are really, really useful for picking out weak signals. You know, if you're struggling to hear a weak signal, it's it's far clearer. You're more focused. I think that you're not so annoying to others because uh, I've been in a room where two people have been operating two separate radios, both got the vo speakers on, both got the volume up loud, and you think, oh, this is just a noise. I'm going to walk out of the room. And I'm sure they're both struggling to hear. So, you know, it's less annoying. And equally... It helps you remain focused at a volume level you're happy with. I'll be honest with you, I cannot stand volume really being loud in, from a speaker. When I'm trying to listen to something, I need to focus and I listen in. And I, need, I don't need it so loud, it's painful. So uh, I, I think headphones are very, very useful to solve that. Okay, well, at the end of the day, this was just a suggestion of a few things to look out for. It's always your choice. You have the choice on what type of headphones you want to use. None of us are the same. We're all different. So uh, what works for me may not work for you. Uh, but what I will say is do what's best for you and uh, do your homework first before you uh, rush out and purchase a set of headsets, an expensive set anyway. And at least enjoy the hobby by having a decent set of headset and... Uh, being able to hear that weak signal rather than all the other noise. I hope that was of use to you. The ICQ Amateur Ham Radio Podcast, serving the amateur ham radio community fortnightly since 2008. Well, all, I hope you enjoyed the feature there on uh, headphones as I just adjust mine and make sure they're in place here just to record now the 73s and the end part of uh, episode 266 here. So we've got uh, quite a lot of feedback on various platforms uh, from the last episode, which was uh, questioning whether or not online purchasing was killing Hamfest. And uh, a couple of um, of the feedbacks came straight into us here at the podcast. Uh, so we'll start the first one here. So Tom uh, Smirk um, said, uh, online is where you buy something you want or need. And Hamfest is where you buy something you didn't know you wanted or needed. Uh, so that's his uh, distinction between how he uses the two. And uh, Ross Carter, VK2 Sierra Sierra, uh, from Australia, of course, mentions that uh, uh, he's been listening through to the feature there. 
And um, he said it obviously affects uh, the field day events. And he said lots of the same things are happening in uh, VK, uh, Australia land, which is very sad to see. Uh, the biggest show uh, is held halfway between Sydney and Newcastle at a race course, a uh, town called uh, Wyoming, I think it's pronounced. And his brother-in-law runs a ham radio shop uh, called Andrews Communication, been going since uh, 1976. Ross has been helping him out on field days for a long time. and He's noticed a gradual decline in attendance at the shows. And he's uh, relating there, Dad, that uh, exactly as you've uh, mentioned, costs are now starting to outweigh the small profit made uh, by the uh, the dealers on these uh, days out. And uh, amateurs attending are looking for special field day prices. Uh, so the main dealers are struggling to uh, offer this and uh, don't attend or they don't find it very profitable. Uh, so certainly, I'd say it raised a lot of uh, interest as well on other social media angles. But uh, generally speaking, it does question, um, I suppose, the, the ham fest and, and certainly the uh, the future of ham fest. Yeah, certainly does, Colin. And uh, yeah, I think I think I th- kind of threw the hand grenade in the room on this one. It, it, it wasn't meant to wind people up. It was a general uh, thought on the ham fest and number of people I've been speaking to. They don't do what they used to do. They're not like the old ham fest used to be. And I've certainly noticed a change in the last 20 years. However, I still believe there are uh, room for the big national and international uh, ham fest. And I also believe there's uh, certainly for you very, very local ones. Uh, certainly we, we run some uh, stories from the cats for Zar. And uh, we'll be along there this year, as I said, because it's a nice little rally that we meet up with friends. And, you know, there are sensible prices for the equipment. So, yeah, I, I kind of think that, OK, the Internet has killed it a little bit, but we're there anyway, Colin. Yeah, I mean, look, we lost Radio Shack in the States and Maplin in the UK for their various reasons and ills. But uh, I suppose if we don't support... Uh, uh, some of these people, uh, and what they're trying to do with physical purchasing, it's going to make it very difficult to know what we're buying on the internet. And uh, I, I know it's a balancing act for everybody. We've only got so much money in our wallets, but uh, uh, certainly it, it's certainly food for thought, as you, as you say from there. Well, as always, guys, we'd like you to consider us at icqpodcast.com for slash donate, just like Nicholas Wood and a monthly annual and uh, a monthly subscription donors have done to help keep the show advert free. Um, we certainly know uh, that's a, a positive for you guys. Um, as I say, rather than having adverts thrown down your uh, uh, your throat diet cover, maybe places do, or uh, selling your data. Um, this certainly isn't how we set the ICQ podcast up. So uh, I say, fund us, and uh, if you find value in the show, certainly uh, drop some uh, shekels in the tin, and we certainly appreciate it. Uh, a few weeks to go until uh, Ham Radio Friedrich Sharvin event is on. Uh, Chris Howard, uh, Ed Durant, myself, and my senior harmonic will be in attendance. Uh, so feel free to come along and say hello. Uh, you know the drill, guys. Orange t-shirts don't represent Dutch uh, football fans all the time. It could be your ICQ presenters then milling around the show. So uh, come along, say hi, and uh, say we'd love to to see you there. Uh, check out the Facebook group uh, and obviously the website, icqpodcast.com, uh, for all the latest news and links, etc., uh, for over the next uh, few weeks and if you haven't done so sign up for the newsletter on the website there and it's a good a good way of uh, getting a couple of notes a week of all the latest news that we're publishing on the website we'd like to thank uh, chris howard mike zero tango charlie hotel martin roffel mike zero sierra golf lima dan romachik kilo bravo six november uniform and ed durant dd5 lima papa for taking part in the uh, news round table with your dad there uh, I say, guys, as always, hope you enjoy that and what the guys are doing from there. Well, that just about, I think, wraps up everything here. I'm just checking through the list. I think we've got everything pretty much ticked. So that's uh, great news there. Um, so uh, I'm just going to uh, send you off to, uh, I say, put the kettle on and uh, rummage in the uh, uh, cupboards and see if you can find any chocolate biscuits there for Mrs. B when she comes home. Yeah, certainly do that, Colin. She won't be long before she's home. So nice cup of tea and a bicky. Uh, will be good for your mum when she gets in. So uh, that's all good from my end. And uh, thoroughly enjoyed doing this episode, like I do all of them. So uh, hopefully people will enjoy them. Exactly, guys. Well, 73 is all, and we'll catch you on a fortnight's time. 73. <laughs>